Yes. Ah, okay. Um, welcome to the Sydney Southeast Asia Centres and the Malaysia and Singapore Society of Australia's webinar on Malaysia today and its near future. Before we, we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the University of Sydney is built on unceded Gadigal land of the Eora Nation and also pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land and the elders past, present and emerging. Selamat Hari Malaysia, happy 58th Malaysia Day to all those marking today in the nation's history, negotiated into being this day in 1963 as a nation with former Borneo colonies, Sabah, Sarawak, and the island of Singapore. As we've learned since 1963, uh, with Singapore's exit from Malaysia just two years later, nation building is a fraught process, perhaps more so in the cloud of Cold Wars past and present. We hope today's discussion will help explain how Malaysia's historic 2018 elections that brought to power the reformist Pakatan Harapan or PH government also led to an unprecedented three prime ministers in three years. Uh, a return to power of the party AMNO, and this past week, a historic political detente between new Prime Minister Ismail Sabri and the Anwar Ibrahim-led PH opposition in a so-called memorandum of understanding that secures AMNO's hold on power. All this after the short-lived Perikatan National Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin seized power last year, only to quit last month after dashing hopes of less political turmoil. The question now is, can this newly installed ninth Prime Minister Ismail Sabri, with his party AMNO back at the helm, improve the lives of Malaysians blighted by the COVID pandemic and a troubled economy? As Malaysia fights to contain the soaring human toll of the pandemic, is Malaysia unique uh, as a case in the region or just part of the region's receding from democracy and economic progress? To start with, um, here's what the Medeka Center's pollster Ibrahim Sufyan told me yesterday about the new deal between the new PM and the opposition, which finally includes enabling the voting rights of 18-year-olds, something our panelist, Kira Yusri, knows much about and will expand on later. I'll just play it and... Um, Thanks. Here we go. You know, most parts of the country are, under, are still under some kind of lockdown. And mm -hmm. so economic activity, to some extent, is still curtailed. And that has, I think, affected a large swath of uh, mission workers and households who've seen their incomes reduced significantly over the last several months. And that's uh, really dampened the public mood. So in terms of public appreciation of the change of the leader, I think there is like a marginal bounce, very small bounce, when Ismail came about. But uh, by and large, it's still the same government, you know. Uh, and, and this is where I think it's interesting. With the opposition having this MOU or confidence and supply agreement, then, you know, this new or rather this, this uh, rebranded uh, government probably might have a slightly better chance because uh, they've silenced their critics, you know, in the sense that they've gotten everybody on board. My view about this MOU, the most significant thing is the ratification and implementation of Undi 18, so allowing 18-year-olds and above to vote, and the automatic voter registration. That's critical because it opens up the political space uh, and allows for a lot of unknown variables to arise. Based on the research that we've done at Medica Center, we know that we've earlier this year, I think around the first quarter of this year, we polled 18-year-olds to 25-year-olds, and we found that more than half of them have not made up their minds, particularly the 18, 19 year olds have not really made up their minds in terms of who they're going to vote for, especially the Malays. Because when we look at the demographics at that level, nearly 70% of 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 20 year olds are Bumi Putras, Malays and indigenous Sabah and Sarawakis. So it's, it's a very much uh, a, a, a Malay and Bumi Putra play at that level. At that segment, you know, I think only 25% are non-Malays. So it is very much uh, a Bumiputra political agenda down there uh, for political parties to reach out to. 
at this point in time, because of curtailment due to lockdowns and COVID rules and all that, none of the parties, I think, have made significant efforts to reach out to young people. And so our view is this, as many as 55, 56% say they don't know who they're going to vote for. But at the same time, 70% say they dislike politicians, they distrust politics. So you have this big problem out there uh, for many young people who have perhaps a very superficial understanding of how politics work in the country, but at the same time, you know, can glean, uh, you know, the impressions, make, have impressions about uh, how politicians are, and most of them are negative, you know, coming out from social media. Uh, you know, all political parties will have a problem, but if these political parties do not creatively come up with things to reach out to young people, it is very likely that when elections come, uh, many of the young people, I'm not saying all, many of them will still vote along the established patterns, which in Malaysia is largely communal and regional based patterns. I think you're muted. Sorry. Uh, thanks for that. That was Ibrahim Sufyan from the Medeca Center um, talking about recent polling and work on uh, what would appear to be a huge voting block about to come on stream and uh, how this might change a lot of the calculations. Um, so for our, our panelists today, we're, we're going to try and have um, a more open free-flowing discussion uh, I believe Gayatri uh, Venkateswaran from Nottingham University, Malaysia will also uh, add to the discussion with a few um, slides to show uh, what she hopes to discuss as well. Um, to begin with, Professor James Chin, I guess won't need um, too much introduction to many of you as Australia's leading commentator on modern Malaysia and as Professor of Asian Studies at the University of Tasmania. Um, also joining us would be Gayatri Venkateswaran of uh, Nottingham University, Malaysia, where she researches and teaches political communications, propaganda, and public relations, and is the former chief of the Southeast Asia Press Alliance. Our youngest panelist, uh, Kira Yusri, will hopefully spark off our, a lively Q&A afterwards as our last speaker. Uh, she is co-founder and director of Malaysia's leading youth movement for democratization known as Undi 18, which successfully advocated for the historic constitutional amendment lowering the voting age to 18 in 2019. Uh, please post your questions uh, in the Zoom Q&A box and we'll endeavor to get through them all. To start with um, James, uh, to help open up our discussion, could you um, share with us some of your thoughts on what this week's historic memorandum of understanding otherwise touted as a confidence supply agreement between the new PM Ismail Sabri and the opposition PH coalition will mean when parliament meets to consider those urgent budget bills these next few weeks. Will governance actually improve after this torrid year and a half? Uh, good morning. So the way I look at the MOU is that this is very much a temporary truce between the opposition and the government. So the whole idea of this temporary truce is basically to give both sides a certain amount of breathing space. Uh, it is widely understood that uh, the key or the key game that's coming up is actually not the budget, it's actually the GE15. So both sides are sort of uh, laying the foundations for GE15. Uh, the reason I say that is because it is quite clear that uh, if you look at the Ismail Sabri government, the way to understand this government is that there was no change in, in August. Basically, what you had was basically musical chairs uh, moving from the Satu to Amno. You look at the ministers appointed, basically reappointments. So the only difference between, say, uh, Mungia Ding and the current uh, Ismail Sabri is that Ismail Sabri is willing to work with what we call Makama, uh, the court cluster in Malaysia. Uh, senior AMNO leaders who are currently charged by the courts. And he's also willing to work with the opposition. But his willingness to work with the opposition doesn't mean he's a reformer. It's simply, like I said, sort of a pause, a truce until the next GE. Uh, I think it's widely understood in Malaysia that they really did not have a choice. Both sides wanted this truce. So 
for very simple reason that there were two key challenges which both sides could not deal with individually. Uh, one, of course, is COVID-19. The other one, which is far more important, I think uh, our friend Ibrahim alluded to, it, which is the reopening of the economy. I think a lot of people outside Malaysia who don't live in Malaysia don't realize how bad the economy is. Uh, you know, the perfect example of that was a couple of months ago, uh, there was a campaign to provide food uh, to, to sections of the Malaysian population. At the start of that program, people thought that, you know, a lot of poor people were asking for food. But if you go to middle class neighborhoods, people were also asking for, for food. So that gives you an idea how bad the, the, the situation is. So basically, the way I look at it is that uh, both sides are preparing for GE15. And my take is that GE15 will be held next year rather than 2023, uh, because there's incentive for both sides to go for earlier uh, general election. Uh, the only thing about the MOU is that it says that the government will not dissolve parliament earlier than uh, 31st of July. So uh, second half of next year is still a viable thing. So the incentive for AMNO or, or the current government to go for general elections, of course, they want to kill off the Satu. Uh, as you know, in, in Malaysia, right, you can only have one dominant Malay party. So right now, uh, you know, the game is played between the Satu and, and, and AMNO. And AMNO obviously uh, want to use the election to politically kill off uh, 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 Satu. The only unknown with that election really is that what is the role that Mahathir will play? Now, I know many of, of people watching this will find it very strange that, you know, that this guy who, who's nearly uh, reaching 100 is still such a prominent figure in Malaysia. Now, he's not a prominent figure in the urban areas or among the chartering class, but the reality is that he's a brand name in the rural area. So if you look at all the past elections in Malaysia, right, basically in a rural Malay area, it was very much a battle has always been between Amno and Pass, right, two players. He came in 2018 and managed to get one third of the rural Malay votes. And now that is highly, highly significant. Now the question is, can he repeat that performance in the next GE, whether he can get a chunk of the rural Malay votes. If he can get a chunk of the Malay votes, or similar to the performance he did in 2018, then you cannot write out, uh, you cannot write him out. He will still be a major player. And of course, the other big question that people are always wondering, especially people outside Malaysia, is that uh, will Anwar Ibrahim be the candidate for the prime ministership uh, for the opposition side? Uh, my guess is that PH will have no choice but to nominate Anwar Ibrahim, but that comes with it a lot of risks. Uh, because we know that uh, a big chunk of the Malay population is against Anwar Ibrahim, and that if they nominate Anwar to be the uh, Prime Minister of Canada, then PH may not reach the figure they have uh, in 2018. So my conclusion is that the MOU is very much a temporary pause. It's an MOU. It's not going to fundamentally change the nature of Malaysian politics. It's very much a sort of a, a stopgap measure because the economy is ailing and because of COVID-19. So basically what we're talking about here, the whole feverish discussion just of the past week and the debates with the opposition about whether they have enough runway to lead up to what will be a very difficult um, GE 15, general elections 15, as soon as next year, is that um, you they had no choice because of their base, the so-called um, urban and working class base um, being very badly damaged by the pandemic. And, but amongst all this as well, which uh, tends to be forgotten by a lot of um, Peninsula Malaysians, is the significant role that the East Malaysia's block of votes has in uh, ensuring this government's stability, you know, and, and whatever progress that might be ahead. So the way I look at it is that uh, the East Malaysian bloc doesn't provide any stability because the East Malaysians have no loyalty to any of the political parties of Peninsula Malaysia. So what the East Malaysians did was basically to give the numbers to Ismail Sabri, a very small or slight majority. As you know, his number is basically 114, the same number that Muyadik had. So that's the reason why I said there's no change. Now, the East Malaysians will probably not play a role in terms of the big fight that's coming up, the one I mentioned between uh, Amno and Basato and Pass. Uh, but what they will do is that if the Malay vote is split, like what happened in 2018, then suddenly they will become important again because you need that block in order to cross the threshold, the 50% in order to form the government. 
Other than that, uh, basically East Malaysians don't really care what's happening in Peninsula Malaysia. They just want maximum autonomy and they want maximum funds in order to build up the two states. To uh, explain a little bit here, um, the current parliament of 222 uh, MPs, we, we're down to about 220, I think, because two seats are not been filled. Uh, and the current new government of Ismail Sabri, along with Muhyiddin Yassin previously, uh, has only barely one, two, perhaps three seat majority. And uh, in, the, in the most recent um, horse trading to try and do a deal for a new government, Anwar Ibrahim's uh, Pakatan Harapan coalition again failed to get the critical numbers across. So it still, still seems, I guess, for those outside that it is so precarious. That is why perhaps um, there was enough weakness uh, for this Perikatan National Coalition part two to do this uh, confidence and supply agreement. But uh, you're suggesting it is really just um, to paper over the cracks of a runway to get to the next elections, which could actually mean a wipeout, no, For, of Pakatan Harapan? Now, what I'm suggesting is that they just put a temporary pause uh, because, for example, right, we know that Pakatan really wanted to insert a much larger stimulus package. So the only way they can do it is that they come to MOU. I have to correct uh, you on a slight thing, right? It is not a CSA. A CSA actually binds the opposition to the government on the budget issue. Uh, this is an MOU. So mm -hmm. like all MOUs, right, the keyword is understanding. So the understanding can come in and out anytime. <laughs> So basically, my take is that uh, the opposition tells the government, we will not disturb you too much if you give us the key items we want in the budget. And the key items they want is basically they want more money to the B40 and the middle class and especially the SMEs. Mm -hmm. So as long as the government delivers on that and the limited set of reforms, like you said, the parliamentary reforms, uh, the tenure tenure for, for, for the prime ministership, uh, immediately implement the, the under 18 votes and all that sort of thing. As long as we agree on the minimum, uh, they're not going to disturb the government at least until July next year. Mm -hmm. So um, I have to re remind your audience that this is not a fundamental shift in Malaysia. Some people are selling it as a historic moment. It is not a historic moment because previously, right, in all the previous budget sessions, they've always had discussions with the opposition. The difference now is that before the actual bill is, pa is passed to the floor of parliament, the opposition will get to see the draft. Previously, they were not given the draft, but there has always been discussions. And one of the interesting things that I always tell people that if you go to the Malaysian parliament, right, if you sit on the gallery, you'll find that these people are always attacking each other on the floor of parliament. During key time, right, they're laughing in the corridors like best friends. So what you see in public may not be what is actually happening, you know, yeah, among the personal uh, relationship between the government and the opposition. So this is very much a temporary truce. Don't read too much into it. Uh, everybody understands that uh, the, the real game or the real price is GE15. Yes, and certainly um, uh, for uh, a veteran party that's held power for so long, UMNO is not about to give up power so easily either. Um, I, I was just curious to get some views from both Gayatri and Kira about this situation. Um, that Gaya, Gaya you, you have done quite a lot of research into how you could say the uh, government, uh, or the Malay majority government has actually managed to um, massage and, and sustain a narrative of dominance and power. And how perhaps in the election to come as well, given the huge, um, influx of young voters, many of whom um, get their information these days, not from the traditional media of the past, but a lot of social media, um, where this might actually influence or take what is, you know, a pretty precarious political situation. Um, thanks, Ken, and, and good morning to everyone who's joined. Um, I think, you know, it continues with the theme that James had started, which is what has really changed, right? And, and looking from the perspective of media, uh, and, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate that where we see the legacy media or the, or, or the sort of, um, you know, I think it's no longer useful to, to say it as mainstream because a lot of 
other forms of media are also mainstream, but legacy media that have been around for many years. Um, you know, in, in I, I completely agree that it is there to uphold and prop up this narrative because that's where the money is and that's where the power is. As much as we hear about all these media companies suffering from financial uh, challenges, you know, scaling down, rational, rationalizing their newsrooms, which is very, very unfortunate, but it is still the seat of money and power uh, as far as media is concerned. And as much as we see, uh, you know, spaces on social media actually becoming a lot more louder or more active, engaging, um, it is not easily controlled because, you know, it is owned by these international or, or global uh, tech companies. Um, but at the same time, there is still a, a kind of a, a powerful force of who dominates this social media spaces as well. So as much as, yes, it's not within the, the full reach of the local owners per se, but as far as, you know, being present on the social media, especially since uh, 2013, where, you know, even, even BN parties knew this is where you have to invest, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very strong presence. And so the narrative actually continues there as well, but in different ways, you know? So if you don't mind, I, can, I just want to show a couple of uh, yeah. images. They're not slides, they're not presentations, but just uh, a couple of images. Um, to, to just reflect a little bit on what has happened, um, especially since GE14 um, uh, and then with the pandemic. I think the most important thing is that with GE14, there was a sense of, you know, hey, here is uh, uh, an opportunity to own, uh, open up. Uh, Pakatan Harapan had made a lot of promises. You know, they were working on some, for example, getting rid of the Anti-Fake News Act, uh, interested in the, the development of an independent media council. They talked about removal of some of the more uh, horrendous laws on, on expression, never got very far. But of course, you know, Muhyiddin was sitting in that particular portfolio. So, you know, no surprise that it was actually a major stumbling block during the, the Pakatan Harapan's uh, time. But when the pandemic came, two things I observed. One, we saw the practices of the the, the, the you know, perfected by the BN in terms of controlling the narrative, controlling the information, controlling criticism. So we saw what had happened to Al Jazeera, South China Morning Post, journalists being called in again and again and again for investigations. Uh, these are forms of harassment and, and intimidation that, you know, really are very old. Uh, James mentioned Mahate. You see Mahate's face and signature throughout all of these uh, reactions as well, right? Um, but the other thing also is that, and you know, this was confirmed by uh, the Reuters digital news uh, report analysis on an annual basis, which is that during this pandemic, we can see a slight increase in trust of the public in the news brands. But that is very easily explainable because here we are in a pandemic, we need information. And in Malaysia, information is controlled by the official sources. That's where you got all your information from. But people needed those to make decisions on a daily basis. And so there was a sort of like going to the news media where you may have left it for a while before because you needed to know what to do, what you couldn't do, right? Uh, so there was an increase and, and brands like Astro, you know, I can just, so here, for example, trust actually went up quite significantly in terms of uh, the news. But also that the brands were, you know, it's like Astro, the star, uh, gaining that kind of uh, following, right? And so it's not that it, it sort of completely uh, died out during this period. There was a kind of dependence on the, uh, on the news media, but only for the pandemic. When it came to political issues, when it came to, to sort of more other social-based issues, the legacy media was still, you know, unreliable. Not only unreliable, they were prejudiced, they were biased, they were partisan. Um, we are in the midst of doing, a, a, you know, further monitoring. And, you know, these are the patterns that have been seen, you know, from GE15, uh, sorry, GE, not GE15, but GE14. Who are the news makers? How do the news media, especially the legacy ones, um, you know, position their stories, right? How do they focus on, um, you know, policy matters for that, uh, for an example. Uh, but GE14... GE13, you, we saw patterns that were exactly the same. You could take data from GE13, change the 13, put it to 14, and you saw the same results, except that in 13, Mahate was on that side of the, the, the fence. 14, he came to this side. He remained as the key newsmaker. So whether we like it or not, he's still going to be uh, uh, you know, the, one of the main uh, newsmakers. But if you look at the patterns of the media, um, take away the pandemic slightly, you would see that there's really not much reconfiguration, right? Ownership remains in the same hands. The faces have changed. So from Amno owning directly uh, Media Prima, it's Johari, it's Said Mokhtar, right? All these are 
it's still establishment in that sense. Utusan is now within a company that is partly owned by AMNO, where it used to be directly owned. So there's really no reconfiguration in that sense. You have, of course, all the other online uh, sites, purely online sites, and people raise a lot of eyebrows about, uh, you know, certain news uh, outlets saying, oh, agenda owned by this and owned by that. Well, political ownership has been the game really for, for the longest time. Um, and I think the consequence of that, and I think as we go on to uh, GD15, um, I think it's very, very unfortunate that we will be in a situation where we have not seen the media, and here I, I, I would really emphasize on the legacy media. We're talking about the NSTs, we're talking about Brita Haryan, the star. Uh, and, and while Sinan Haryan may appear to be a lot more different in its, in its approach and, and, and treatment of issues, but very similar ways of running the newsrooms, uh, TVs definitely, is that they will maintain this uh, partisan position but not only to, to be partisan, but continue this top-down approach to news and a decline in professional and quality standards. We have seen that happen over the years. They can cry the government is controlling, but they've really done very little to up their own game as independent critical content providers. And in that sense, they are really losing out to people who are using social media without the kind of infrastructure that these media have and putting out far better quality content, much more critical, provocative. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's pushing some of these discussions in, in a space where the media actually cannot compete. I mean, you go online, the legacy media with all its years of investment and training cannot compete with the users. Now, it doesn't mean that one is better than the other, but I think it's not a level playing field now because the media cannot actually compete online. I think it's really uh, uh, very obvious, but they will continue to inform the official dominant narrative. I think, you know, just to answer your question, it will, it will continue to, to inform. And, you know, I think again, because we haven't really seen this great change in reform in ownership, which is one of our major stumbling blocks. Um, I don't see that as we go into GE15 that we are going to have much more different, um, uh, you know, patterns. You know, the day, up to the day before, election day in, in 2018, the content in media like NSD and TV3 were, you know, you, in today's language, you'll say that's fake news, right? Because they were talking about how wonderful BN was and how they were going to win pants down and hands down and whatever. And they didn't, they were not able to inform as accurately as possible. And so, you know, after the 9th of May, suddenly they had this awakening and felt, oh, we're going to be different. And for them, being different was being able to criticize Guan Eng in an official space because, well, he's minister. You want us to be critical, right? So we're criticizing uh, Guan Eng. And the minute it changed with Lanka Sheraton, they're just back to being boosting up, you know, the sort of the, the, the Basatus and the uh, Amno. So, you know, in our current research, you can see very clear patterns on emergency declarations and things like that. Basatu, yay, positive. Pass, yay, positive. Yeah. Amno was far more vibrant in terms of the coverage. They were more sort of mixed, you know, but it was very clear the, the, the treatment. So I think that that's actually, um, you know, as we are going towards GE15, I think there will be a lot more among users and voters uh, for sure going towards social media because I think that they have, I think the power of being able to, to, to generate your own content is much more uh, um, exciting than having to rely on the media that have, they have lost trust. I mean, definitely, except for this, this kind of pandemic, uh, I think it's an exception. Uh, but what's going to happen on social media, I'm just going to turn this off, uh, like the Facebooks and, and, and WhatsApp, is that you're going to find a lot more, as we have seen with the pandemic, um, you know, unverified information. Uh, so it's, it's more popular narratives that will get out there. So if you are a politician and you know how to capture that, then it's going to be that kind of popular narrative, whereas the dominant narratives will, of course, you know, be there as part of the, the media. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, sort of see if that has been able to answer your question, Ken, and, and see if you, yeah, and go from there. Great. Th thanks. Thanks for that, Gaia. Um, I, I guess it's, it's really both a struggle for legitimacy and credibility, not only of a government, but also of the media and how um, both are in some ways hostage to this new yeah. social media phenomena. And in some ways also 
is the nation itself a bit hostage to this country of all men leading it? Absolutely. And I, and, and I, and I think this is something that maybe Kira can help uh, explain for us uh, what this huge um, potential of a, a youth vote bank is going to make uh, in terms of maybe, you know, them saving us from a nation of all men. Yeah, thanks, Kian, and thanks for having me here today. It's really an honor to share a panel with Gayatri and uh, Professor James as well. Um, I think when when Undi Yiking is finally uh, implemented, and I think also, also one of the reasons why it keeps being delayed over and over again, right? So uh, actually, so interestingly enough, like, you know, we were discussing the MOU earlier today, but, you know, I, another similar promise made was over two years ago, Imam Pakatan Harapan and Barisan National, to implement Undi Yiking within two years, on time, on track, right? It was a cross-party collaboration, it was a bipartisan historic moment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, two years later, um, you know, the, the government in power can easily just say that they are delaying it because that kind of promise is not legally binding, you know, and that's the problem when we aren't able to hold our parliamentarians uh, accountable to their promises, right? Uh, so earlier this year, when Udi 18 was announced to be delayed, uh, young people, you know, across both sides of the political aisle became very angry and they turned out uh, to protest against it. Uh, and ever since then, uh, for us at Undi Yiting, the organization, we've done multiple protests, we've gone, we've gone to court as well, uh, and recently the Kuching High Court has, um, you know, ruled in our favor, uh, and so far the government has not mentioned any plans of appealing it, but we hope they will not appeal and focus on implementing it as soon as possible. So why is Undi Yiting such a sensitive reform and so seemingly, you know, so, so, so scary for the government to implement as soon as possible? I think it's because it's unpredictable. Right, young people are very unpredictable, and this is the first time, uh, you know, that uh, because you know, if only is implemented, uh, automatic voter registration will come shortly as well. And what this means that it will, you know, drastically increase the electoral role um, in a very quick manner. And I think a lot of politicians are not able to, you know, uh, plan their strategies or think ahead on how to um, engage all these uh, new voters that are going to come in uh, in one go. Um, so I think. Uh, uh, you know, for young people, I think we are actually not that different from other generations of voters, to be very honest. I don't think, I think many people seem to think that, you know, first of all, young people vote all the same way. Young people all think the same way. And we all are somehow incredibly different from our parents and our grandparents. But I don't think so. You know, I think while the issues that we face are very different, such as employment, uh, education, you know, these are still economic bread and butter issues. But fundamentally, you know, People my generation have also been brought up in a time of alku. We have been brought up in a time where you know schools and universities are not encouraged to talk about politics. We're not encouraged to think critically. We're not challenged in our ideologies and our and, and our mindsets. So I think you know to to you know it depends who you ask, right? Sometimes you realize that uh, you know young young voters may not be as progressive as everyone assumes they are, and I think that's the real danger. And politicians just assumes. That young, uh, that you know, we are, uh, we are all like-minded, and we all vote the same way. You know, I think when we were organizing the protest, uh, many young people also refused to support it, right? Because they don't think that uh, it was right. They don't think it's the right time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then the question is that how do you make, um, how do you educate the mass populace so that people understand what's at stake? And I think that's what many um, activists this year is trying to do. Uh, I think the pandemic, especially, has brought in light the injustices, the gaps in our governance. Um, and I think especially young people who are um, adversely affected by, uh, by, by, by the situation is trying their best to pinpoint these issues at the forefront uh, of many discussions and discourse. And I think that's why you see, uh, for example, the Solidarity Secretary Solidarity Rakyat SSR has been very, um, uh, very clear in their demands, uh, for example, uh, to demand for Mohidin step down for parliament to reopen properly and for automatic moratorium. So you put in um, a mix of economic and institutional reforms as well. And on whether the, I, I think there's also, there's always been a question of whether the public cares about institutional reforms. Um, I think it's very interesting that, you know, in Mukidin's last week of being in power, I think three days before he, he resigned, he offered all these institutional reforms. Does it mean that, you know, um, I, I, I personally, I, I don't understand. I don't understand why. Um, is it, do they think that, you know, 
like for all the months they said the people, the general people, the rural population don't understand institutional reform, yet why is this the last straw um, for him? Why is this the last straw for this conservative government, uh, you know, when, when NGOs have always been told that, oh, conservatives don't care about reforms, yet these conservative governments are using institutional reforms as a way to um, barter, as a way to trade. Um, I think someone pointed out, um, I think uh, yesterday, I think uh, Bridget Welsh in an interview with Conservatives pointed out that MOU actually does not contain as much economic um, negotiations, but mostly reforms, right? Um, and while we can discuss whether this is good or bad, I think it's a very interesting um, shift in our political uh, 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 landscape, at least to see politicians now openly using reforms as a way to trade with each other, as a way of discussion. Um, it could be because now they realize how the systems can can be, you know, abused. Uh, how the, how how the other side can abuse the system in in the in incumbent's favor, and now they realize that no one actually can hold power for so long. And I think that's where young voters also come in very strongly, whereby we always make our stance very clear that we are not loyal to specific politicians or specific political parties, but we want our concerns heard and we want. Uh, you know, our, our demands to be, to be at least listened to, you know, and I think for young people at least, you know, we have nothing but time. <laughs> we have nothing but time ahead of us uh, until the next general election to continue to assert uh, our presence and to take up the space. And I think that's something that, you know, in my engagements at least with politicians, is something that they just can't read, um, you know, no matter, you know, because um, on one hand, they will have advisors telling them social media is not everything. On the other hand, you cannot ignore the voices of social media as it grows larger and larger. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, uh, um, I'm sure you guys have insights on this, but, you know, we cannot ignore netizens as not being people because everyone that puts out a Facebook status, everyone that puts out a tweet are, are real people voicing out their issues. And I think um, that's what makes politicians on either side very insecure. Whether this will change our political landscape and tie in the next general election, I don't think so yet because there are still uh, barriers within the institution that prevents young people from rising in a quicker manner. Um, you know, um, the lack of political funding act, the lack of uh, recall elections, uh, and, all this and, and all these reforms still prevent young people from uh, rising up, uh, even though they may be charismatic, even though they may be intelligent. I mean, personally, if you take a look at, you know, the young politicians that DAP puts forward in their councillors and uh, are doing level, you can see that these are they're very interested in policy changes and policy discourse. But in Malaysia, we still have, you know, uh, this expectation of politicians to be politically kick mic, right? Where they must go down to the ground every single day. They must give out rice and, and food aid every single day. And because of that, uh, you know, politicians with money and politicians with allocations will be able to win and advance much further than younger politicians with less resources, even though um, you know, they have the right vision, they have uh, progressive ideas and, 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 and you know, uh, and, or even because they're very, and even if they're very intelligent uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, policy making. Mm. Thanks for that, Kira. Um, I think we can probably try and tackle a few of these questions that are now coming in. Uh, you have managed, Kira, actually to help answer two of them so far already. Um, and I was just curious, uh, maybe uh, Gayatri can try and um, address one of these questions that have just come in as well. Because uh, overall, a lot of this, what you were just talking about again, Kira, was um, really about the ability uh, for legitimate dissent to take place and for it to be addressed and for, not, for people not to be disconnected or disenfranchised from the conversation and debate. And that's something I think uh, uh, one of the questions uh, touches on, but uh, where, where basically, you know, how, how can um, voters or young people stay engaged in a political system uh, where politicians appear more and more disconnected from uh, the people's w will and wishes. Um, before we get to that, there's a question from uh, Richard Lowe, which basically I think is addressed to you, Gaia, whether, oh, and to anyone else who wants to answer, James as well, whether political parties should be banned or curbed from ownership uh, in any media. Um, thanks for that question. Um, I think there are a couple of issues here. Number one, um, preventing ownership is never the, you know, never really the kind of advocacy I would do. 
um, except that in the case of Malaysia, like many of our friends also in, in uh, Southeast Asia, but also much more broader in, in you know, post-conflict um, post or post-transition uh, societies. Um, our challenge is that our political economy system is really, really problematic. So to, to discuss the media, one really also has to discuss what is our economic structures. And we have such a weak economic structure. We are patronage based, corruption is really, really, really high. And so to decouple politics from you know, business and the economy means a reform of our overall economic structure, which is one of my criticisms in uh, you know, looking at say ideas of reforms, not just in Malaysia, but also in other places is to think and imagine that, hey, if we fix something that is you know, labeled as media and we fix it there, therefore the problems will be solved. I think it's really quite uh, narrow, narrow sighted la, because it is tied so much to the kind of broader uh, structure. So if you look at who owns a lot of this legacy media, who's investing in some of the more newer media, the ties that they have with the pol political, you know, parties, the system is very, very strong. So unless we are prepared to say, reform entirely GLC, reform entirely the way that licenses are issued for a range of things, then we are, uh, you know, by just saying, look, let's ban political parties actually doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. Because another very important feature in a lot of these kinds of systems is proxy ownership. And so if we can't, you know, if we are not clear about, you know, the kind of uh, ownership structures, um, you know, it will hide behind proxies. Lah. So I think we need to have a very clear sort of definition of ownership as well. And, and I think that it's, um, it's far more important to create a, a more dynamic environment in which there's diversity, there's removal of barriers to enter into the media industry. And you know, that, that doesn't rely on this kind of issuance of licenses, which is why the online seems a lot more uh, uh, you know, preferred, but anyone with the ability to, to say set up TV, whether it's digital multimedia, you know, you, you need to remove that, that barriers of uh, entry. But media is an expensive business. It is an expensive business, which is why I think we need to think more about democratizing the media by not thinking about only a particular structure of media, but also to open up to actual real public interest media, community media that allows people to take more ownership of, of their content. So to answer very quickly Richard's point, um, I think it is, um, it's very sexy to say, hey, let's remove pol political ownership. Gobin also actually said that when he was minister. But my question is, where do you draw the line? Do you draw the line at, say, the person is a member of the, the, the committee or council of the party, branch, division leader, and their family? Can they, would they, would they be included, excluded in this definition? What is the percentage? 7%, 20%? How do you define those things? And I think you can't answer that question until looking at the broader one. And related to that, Richard, would be, I suppose, practice of transparency and accountability. One has to be transparent with um, where the money is coming from. One has to be accountable for that as well. I think what we have in Malaysia is a complete lack of accountability of the media because they have the impunity, especially given uh, with, the, with, the, with the more older media, yeah? there is somewhat of an impunity towards, uh, you know, ethical issues and, you know, fairness, uh, you know, diversity and plurality. So I think that one question like that forces us to actually look at multiple aspects uh, uh, to, to, to address it. Yeah. Mm. Great. Thanks, Gaya. And it's good that you also touched on yeah, the, the issue of legacy media and perhaps legislation reform itself is not enough um, to, to look at. Perhaps the public conversation also needs to uh, ramp up for that. Um, because I, I guess it was touched on by Kira earlier as well that um, the whole social media campaigns, the hashtags of Karajan Gagal failed government, the hoisting of white flags for help and the hoisting of black flags to express public anger at a previous failing government um, also indicates that there are a lot of uh, online communities, if you like, that also matter in this discussion that shouldn't be ruled out. I, I guess that's what you're getting at, right, Kira, previously. And also um, how it touches on um, one of the questions that was asked, I think, to you, uh, Kira, about um, how, how do you, you know, stay engaged with uh, politicians who appear more and more disconnected and whether parties that are 
youth-oriented like Muda have any chance to tap into this? It's an interesting question. I think um, to get to stay engaged, um, well, I think young people have become very creative in trying to get engaged with their politicians. Uh, in Undi Eking's programs, we always encourage um, our participants to research who their local MP and Adun's are and to actually find out ways of how to reach out to them. Um, I think MPs in the in, in uh, urban areas are a bit more approachable because they're a bit more visible online. But I think uh, MPs in rural areas especially, it's a bit harder to get to reach out to them. Um, primarily also because maybe not all of them have like, you know, a social media manager, not all of them have a team that even does like engagements for them. Um, I think uh, personally, I think for example, in Sarawak, I think one of the most engaged, uh, the most approachable MP is Wabi Lupanisman of CBT um, because he's one of the youngest, I think the youngest GPS MP out there. So he actively reaches out to uh, our counterparts in Indi Sarawak to try to engage um, young voters and also do, do outreach with, with um, Sarawak in youth. Um, yeah, so, so that's that, right? So I think it really, so if, I feel like if the politicians uh, make a conscious effort to do outreach uh, to young Malaysians, then they will be able to actually tap into the youth voters very, very easily. Look at how uh, Said Sadiq is doing it, look at how Michelle Ng, Lin Wei Wei is doing it, and even now recently, Sharon Hamdan has also explored new Twitter, uh, sorry, uh, TikTok accounts and things like just to do outreach to them. It's really easy to tap into young people because we're always online, we're always engaged. It's a matter of whether um, you know, uh, they 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 dare to you know actually do this sort of like public and, and actually in a way quite vulnerable engagement with young people because young people because people will, actually not just young people people in general will not hold back online they will just make their voices heard whether you like it or not. Um, on the topic of Muda, I think Muda faces a quite a challenging landscape to enter despite having you know um Syed Sadiq as his, as his, as his president um, you know they have only one MP. Uh, and, you know, even then it will be a challenge to, I think, uh, retain his seat because, you know, uh, it's, it's right next to Bangun, which is uh, Mugide Yase's seat right now. Um, and also, you know, it, it's, it's Johor is not a uh, PH uh, state. So I think um, without Muda being registered, they are also vulnerable to um, finding ways to contest the next election. And that might involve contesting under a different banner, which might dilute their branding. Um, you know, as a uh, youth party, as a, you know, um, uh, a third force or, uh, or a way to check and balance um, other major political parties out there. Um, but looking at their uh, members' uh, statements and all that, it looks like they played a role in trying to ensure um, Anwar became uh, prime, become prime minister during uh, that vacuum for about uh, one week or so. But of course, ultimately, you know, Isla Sabri still became prime minister. And then the question comes to, so where does Muda play in all of this, right? Muda is still not officially part of Pakatan Parapan, um, you know, uh, and in the MOU as well, you can see that, you know, some uh, of the other smaller parties like Perjuang or that will say, well, why would we not go in and why would we not discuss? No, we don't know what happens in their political conversation, but the fact of the matter is, um, the question comes in an upcoming general election, uh, is it smarter to go in as an independent party or is it smarter to go in as a coalition or is it smarter to go in uh, under a different uh, party's banner such as either Warisan or PKR or DAP? I think those are the tough decisions that Muda has to make um, as long as they remain uh, unregistered. And this is what some of the structural barriers that I was highlighting earlier, right? That young people may have dreams and aspirations of disrupting the political landscape, but when you have ROS, which is under the purview of the Ministry of Home Affairs, deciding who gets to be a political party and then ultimately who gets to run in, in elections. It's you you join the game, um, you know, you join the game with with, with less equipment than uh, all the other players, and, and you are immediately, you know, unable to comp and it's immediately not not a, a level playing field. So how is that fair uh, for for not just young people actually, but for anyone who wants to make a difference uh, in, in our political scene? It's extremely difficult to disrupt. Uh, and, and, and ultimately, it will always favor uh, the government. So, you know, I think that's why, um, you know, looking forward with, with, um, with this MOU as a starting point even, right, is that how do we make institutions independent and truly free from uh, political maneuvering? I think that is the hardest challenge uh, that we have to overcome. Until then, I think new players like Muda or even, or, and even youth or other, um, uh, other players interested to, to disrupt the scene will have a fair chance at doing so. Mm. Thanks for that. I mean, it's good that you touch on these need for institutional reforms, which I guess um, helps uh, seg us into questions that have been uh, aimed at James about the question marks, again, 
over whether the memorandum of understanding, the MOU, is actually good or bad for the long run health of Malaysian politics. This question comes from Alisa Ling. Uh, is the short term stability worth it? Or will muzzling the opposition reduce their scope to challenge uh, and keep the account, uh, government accountable? And I guess related to that is another question from Christopher Sim about uh, why did, you know, and whether, you know, Ismail Sabri bringing back Najib Raza, uh, considering the baggage he has, uh, an indication of what this new government's intent is? James? Okay. So before I answer those questions, I just want to add my, my, uh, my thoughts on these young voters. I think one of the things that's missing from the debate is that increasingly, because uh, both sides know that this large chunk of voters are coming in, uh, increasingly, they, they, uh, we're sort of moving towards the American style of politics. Because I've been hearing noises that they've been hiring consultants to do that data mining and all that sort of thing in order to go after the young voters. Uh, we saw a bit of that in 2018, and of course that company blew up. Uh, but it's my understanding that, uh, you know, how should I put this delicately? There, there are some Malaysians who have some overseas experience in this thing, who has come back in Malaysia and started work, working on this issue. Uh, I can speak from personal experience because I have some contact with these people and that they're, they're trying to sell very, very sophisticated packages about how to reach out to these young voters. The other point I wanted to make is that um, I think Kira is absolutely right. We should not assume that young voters are a homogeneous group. And in fact, I would argue that you know, before the young voters came in, a lot of these mainstream political parties have very active youth wins. So even before, you know, before only 18, right, they were already reaching out to universities. Uh, a lot of political parties used to hold these holiday camps. They call it, uh, I, I can't remember it, I, I think they call it some sort of uh, you know, character building or camps or whatever, where it's actually a front for all these political parties. So they've actually done a lot of work with, with young people. The big difference between the, the, the old days and now is that uh, the young people are bombarded with so much information. Uh, the information is constantly changing. And, uh, you know, as Kira mentioned, they're online 24-7. I think that is the only difference. Other than that, I would say that the mainstream political parties actually have done a lot of outreach to young people. And we should not assume that all young people are going to vote in a certain way or the anti-establishment. In fact, a lot of young people are actually pro-establishment because uh, they've learned very quickly that in the Malaysian parlay, right, cari makan means that you find a role in the political parties. Now, coming back to your question about uh, Ismail Sabri, why did he deal with, with Najib and, and Zahid? The answer is very simple. Uh, if you look at the chronology of how Muyadin was deposed, right, uh, the fire was started by Zahid and, and Najib. And uh, the crucial point, of course, was when the king intervened. But basically, those two lit the fire uh, to pull, pull uh, Muyadin down, and uh, it was successful. So we're talking about a government with at most three or four uh, MP majority, which means that uh, the Zahid and Najib group, they have about 11 or a dozen of them. If three or four of them decided to pull out, right, then the government is finished. Uh, having said that, uh, that's the reason why I said there's lots of incentive on both sides to make sure that you know, there was a period of stability with COVID, with bad feelings among the people, everyone's sick and tired of politics to push this through. Uh, my take is that uh, uh, going to go it heads towards uh, G15, I think each of those political parties in terms of the major fundamental problems, uh, they're not gonna deal with it. So when I talk about the major fundamental problems, I'm talking about the real long-term problems that Malaysia face. And I'll just quickly run through the list. Uh, the, list. the first is education. We all know there's a big problem with education primary school all the way up to tertiary level. Secondly, we have a big problem in the economy. We're caught in a middle income trap. We've been talking about it for more than 10 years. Nothing has happened. Nothing has happened when we reformed the NEP. We've got big problems with income inequality. The gap is getting bigger and bigger. We've got big problems with brain drain. Uh, never mind me, but, but <laughs> this is a reality, okay? And the, the, the thing about brain drain is that 15 years ago and today is that today, right? I suspect at least half are younger Malays professionals. So even the, the Malays who are supposedly the beneficiaries of the system, they're living as well. And of course, uh, the big elephant in the room, the issue of identity politics, the rise of political Islam. All these things I'm talking about, right? Everybody knows are big, big issues, but we've just spent the last 45 minutes talking around everything else except these five big issues. Why? Because it basically reflects what the political parties are doing. 
and the political leadership is doing. They're not worried about this. And it comes back to my earlier point. They're all positioning for G15. They don't care about all these long-term issues. But you and I both know, right? If you don't deal with these issues, 10 years time, it'll come back to bite you in a big way. And a very simple example of that, 10 years ago, we were laugh at Vietnam. We thought about Vietnamese brides, you know, uh, factory workers from Vietnam. Do you know that in economic terms, right? Vietnam has overtaken Malaysia. If you look at the core, the core statistics, they've actually overtaken Malaysia. So I, I, I think, I don't know, when we, when we have a discussion on Malaysian politics, I think it's so important that we keep an eye on the big issues. And one of the core, core things that I always, uh, you know, worry about is that why are we taking our balls off the really, really big issues? Because if we don't deal with this, right, uh, then I think the country will have for a real a turbulent period. It really doesn't matter who wins because this thing will come back to bite you. Thanks, James. Uh, I, I guess that's something that is always in the back of our minds in the discussion of how, you know, legitimate government can only implement those difficult reforms and uh, address these difficult issues. And that's been the problem, right? The question of who has the right or credibility to push that through. I, I suppose that's related to uh, a question here from Greg Lopez, uh, who asks, and I guess this is partly addressed to Kira, uh, whether we know what are the social movements, non-government organizations, grassroots movements, etc., that represent young people in Malaysia. And uh, this is, I think, related to also whether there are uh, similar projects and research looking into uh, upcoming uh, G15 and whether uh, any of you are, you know, compiling such data to look at um, uh, groups like these uh, young groups, um, Kira? Um, I think there are, I think there are many youth groups in Malaysia trying to push the discussion forward, uh, especially uh, for democracy and political education actually recently, um, especially at, at, as Undi Ikin was uh, passed two years ago. Uh, so Undi Ikin is one of us, one of them. We have an alumni network of almost 10,000 young people that have been through our programs or attended our sessions or webinars or, or camps. Um, but there are many other young people, you know, actually organizations run by 18, 19 year olds, such as Maya Movement, We See Solidarity, whose co-founder at 20 years old was arrested and locked up in Jinjiang uh, for almost 10 hours under the Sedition Act. She is too young to vote, but she has been arrested under the Sedition Act. You know, I think young Malaysians have been pushing forward um, uh, discussions of climate change, especially through uh, campaigns like My Hutai, campaigns like Climate Action Kami, uh, you know, protesting outside uh, SUK uh, for the Kuala Lumpur North Forest Reserve as well. These are all led and held by Malaysians under 30 years old. So I think uh, upcoming, uh, uh, moving over G15, no matter when it is, uh, looks like it might be July next year, you'll see um, more and more youth voices who are non-partisan, I think that's very important, who are non-partisan, that will come up and make their concerns heard on various issues of economy, education, and climate change. I think these are the three main um, issues that, are, that young people are, are most concerned about. Um, and I think for, for me, at least, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of all these other youth organizations. Um, but I think uh, for only 18, we've, we are focusing on uh, collecting aspirations and voices and channeling it towards advocacy in a structured manner. Uh, so that it's not just, uh, you know, we want to educate young people to not just complain about issues or get angry about it, but to have the facts and knowledge behind uh, what they're uh, they're working on as well. So our, our most recent program, Deva Media Malaysia, which directory is a is a mentor of, um, you know, we have two hundred twenty two young people from every single constituency in Malaysia. So you have urban rural representation, you have um, upper class, lower class, middle class representation, you have OKU around our space, Sabah Sarawak in representation in one program uh, where we work with them uh, on on various issues such as right to information, anti corruption, institutional reforms. Uh, policy making so that you know ideally by the time um you know when when uh when when g15 comes uh, sorry when the next i when g15 comes um you know these discussions uh will have uh, uh, uh youth voices incorporated in it uh, and their concerns mm. um thanks thanks kira uh that in a way also i guess um leads us into uh, the broader discussion uh, that I think James and I have had uh, over the past you know several weeks about while trying to think about this webinar um, how 
whether Malaysia is really unique in the region or really just reflecting one of the many examples of this uh, receding from uh, more democracy and uh, more reformist type of politics. Um, and I'm Simping uh, from Sydney University has you know, asked whether the COVID pandemic has actually weakened this transnational anti-establishment networks that uh, had perhaps informed the past 20 years of so-called reformacy politics in Malaysia that um, someone like Anwar Ibrahim was strongly identified with, who himself um, is, is in many ways a diminished character. Would you say that, James? Uh, no. I will put out the receding of democracy uh, throughout the region uh, to other factors. My take is that the COVID-19 thing uh, is basically a pause in the transformation of Southeast Asia, because I think one of the things that's very clear about Southeast Asia is that uh, people have very short memories. So once we fully recover, then we're back to the, the normal uh, rules of, of, of politics. I think the key reason why we're seeing a, a sort of a recession democracy in Southeast Asia has got to do with, uh, partly got to do with the rise of China, uh, but the major problem we're seeing is because I think there's a lot of economic turbulence, a lot of disruption in the economy. And this feeds into this idea of, of, of uh, more democracy. I think, um, I think the COVID-19 thing, when we look back in history, it is a sort of a pause in how the way the world works for two years. Uh, the major changes that we'll be seeing uh, is probably uh, in the area of things like logistics, there will be fundamental change, uh, fundamental change the way we work. Uh, maybe uh, uh, one or two other areas, but I don't think there'll be a lasting lasting impact on, on the way people conduct politics in Southeast Asia. Mm. Thanks, James. Um, we really have to go and wrap it, partly for a very busy Malaysia day, it turns out. Um, I was thinking if it's possible, uh, whether you have any final words, a couple of seconds each, maybe from Gaia and Kira, um, before we uh, bid goodbye. Gaia? Yeah, um, maybe by wrap, wrapping up, also just addressing our region. Um, I think that, uh, it, I think it forces us to ask what exactly we mean by democracy as well. And I think that like James, I think uh, we do need to look back a little bit and I think not to use the pandemic as a way of framing whether we have receded in terms of, you know, democratic practices in the region. I think that has happened already. Uh, but what is, what is interesting now is the kind of attention and focus that more people have on political inst institutions and empowerment. And I would say that as far as networks are concerned, actually we have seen a lot more grow during this time, uh, transnational networks, uh, especially in the region, like the Milk Tea, Milk Tea Alliance, for example, right? So I think that it's not so much that it's just receding now, we have had that problem already uh, with the Philippines, with Thailand uh, already now, you know, eight to 10 years, uh, and, and what the pandemic has done, you know, done is to maybe just focus a lot more people on those issues. And I think that may, be, may have a positive side to it, which is to garner and to, to, to have a much wider base uh, or mass that's interested in, in political discussions. And I, and I think that that might be my sort of closing remarks that maybe the one thing to come out of this pandemic is that there is a, a, a bit more interest also in the media, and I think that I'm very excited by that, that people are questioning the media a lot more today than they were possibly like 15 uh, years ago. And I think that's always a good thing. Kira, do you um, have I think just a very quick one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm naturally an optimistic person. So I think for anyone watching this, I think we need to have, we should have faith in young people because, uh, you know, I think we have no choice but to invest in them and their growth. Uh, and when GE15 eventually comes, I hope that by then OT18 is enforced and we will see, um, you know, um, it'll be very interesting to see, I think, how young people decide. Uh, and I think they will play a very big part in deciding it. So the question now is how do institutions such as universities, schools, governments, parties, uh, is going to galvanize that force of power uh, in the upcoming general election? Great. Thanks, Kira. And thank you for all the uh, questions that uh, people have been sending in. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. However, uh, I think in the invites that uh, you all um, subscribe to, uh, there are links also to continue this conversation further, uh, both through the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre at Sydney University, uh, as well. Um, coming up is the Malaysia 
uh, Australia Singapore Society um, Association's um, conference, I think in November, in which I think James is going to be talking at as well. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it's been a very fruitful discussion as ever. We don't have enough time, um, but thank you for joining us today.